Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Tyler Pritchard. I'm a current faculty member here in the Grenfell Psychology Program and a form former student. Um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone here this afternoon. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is traditional Mi'kmaq territory, and we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, Inuit of this province. What a day. So today we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of psychology degrees at Grenfell campus. So the campus opened in 1975 as Memorial University's West Coast Regional College and was renamed Sir Wilfred Grenfell College in 1979. In 2010, it became Grenfell campus, Memorial University of Newfoundland. And it's certainly grown over the years. As many of us have seen, there are many more buildings and many more programs. With psychology degree programs starting in 1993, when I was a wee lad, psychology students no longer had to go to the St. John's campus. Today, Grenfell has 17 undergraduate and eight graduate degree programs. That's substantial growth. This morning, we dedicated a plaque in recognition of the faculty who made this milestone possible, the founders, as they were dubbed this morning, Doctors, Les Cake, Tom Daniels, Jim Duffy, Duncan Ferguson, Ferguson, Roy Hostetter, and Dan Stewart. This afternoon, we're celebrating 30 years of excellence in psychology at Grenfell. We wanted to highlight and celebrate the achievement of some graduates in our program. So we asked former students to share some favorite memories of their time at Grenfell, and the results which you saw on the screen before this started, and we'll show it again afterwards in case you missed it. The alumni who responded are currently working in a variety of careers and positions. For example, some are working as probation officers, child management specialists, sales consultants, social workers, mental health counselors, physiotherapists, researchers at Shopify, youth counselors, nurse practitioners, family physicians, teachers, clinical therapists, psychologists, and professor. So I myself graduated in 2015. I have very fond memories of this program. I came back and did a pre-doctoral residency with Dr. Veronica Hutchings. You couldn't keep me away. For some reason, I'm drawn back here for good reasons. And I will note that Dr. Hutchings is another graduate of our program. So I'm now in the second year of my sabbatical replacements here at Grenfell in the psychology program. And I can't tell you the warmth that I feel to have my name on the doors of some of my previous professors. What an impact you've had on me. The psychology program is proud of how our alumni are making their way in the world, making the world a better place, leaving their mark. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Bud Tucker, exemplifies this. Specifically, with the foundation our students receive in the program, through the skills they learn, develop, and refine, and ultimately contribute to their professional and personal success, and again, leave their mark in the world. The psychology program is grateful for the support we've received to host these events. We extend our appreciation for financial support to the Office of the Dean of the School of Arts and Social Science through the Scholarship in the Arts Program, to the Office of the Vice President Grenfell, and the Office of Research and Graduate Studies. We also wanna thank the folks in Marketing and Communication for their assistance and support. I would first like to invite Dr. Ian Sutherland, Vice President Grenfell, to bring greetings. Thank you, Dr. Pritchard. I have notes, I apologize. I reread Sonia's invitation this morning and said, we would like you to speak for five to 10 minutes. And I thought, okay, great, I need notes for that. <laughs> I won't speak for that long. Uh, but welcome everyone, it's a very, particularly wonderful to welcome some of the alumni that are here today, some of whom we are, of course, employing as faculty members, Dr. Hutchings, Dr. Pritchard, uh, and to returning faculty and staff that have been back during the day. And of course, a very special warm welcome to our very special guest, Dr. Bud Tucker. We are so proud, I am so proud, of all the achievements of the psychology program here at Grenfell Campus. It's one of the highest demand programs currently, and it is one of the highest demand programs at Grenfell historically. And I won't list through all the achievements of the program and the work of people like Dr. Les Cake, 
Um, but just think of all the students that have gone through and graduated from the, this program over the last 30 years and everything that they have contributed in their own spheres of influence around the world in that time. And then think about the immense research contributions, the immense program and course development contributions of all the faculty members and all the instructors in the psychology program over those 30 years. It's truly incredible. And the story of the psychology program and all of the success is the story of the success of Grenfell campus. Tyler, you referenced the, the growth and development of this place from originally the Western Regional College through to becoming eventually Sir Wilfrid Grenfell campus and now Grenfell campus Memorial University. So we have grown from very humble beginnings. The last time Dr. Tucker was here, this where I am standing was outdoors. Uh, the entrance was over there. My office would have been hanging in space. Uh, we have, it still is hanging in space, by the way, many years now. We have expanded so much and become an absolutely integral, distinct and unique and impactful part of one of Canada's greatest universities, and that is Memorial University. So from humble beginnings, we now count three, I always say three slash four schools, SAS, SOFA, Science and the Environment, because they don't have an acronym that makes a word, SAS, SOFA, uh, and the Western Regional School of Nursing as, of course, the affiliated school. We boast this beautiful, vibrant and ever expanding main campus at the top of University Drive, but it's not just this campus, it's also the Center for Research and Innovation, which we just opened in downtown Cornerbrook. It's also the Bombay Aquarium and Research Station that we have up in Norris Point, and so much more that is now part of Grenfell Campus. We now are a graduate degree granting place, not just an undergraduate degree granting place. We have an ever expanding amount of research activities. We are now a multi-million dollar research grant, a multi-million dollar research active campus. It's incredible where this place has come from. And throughout all of that, the psychology program uh, has been absolutely integral. And it is really a primary draw for students here. As I travel around the world in student recruitment missions, I hear more often than, than any other phrase, can you tell me about the psychology program that you have there at Grenfell campus? It is really a, a tremendous draw of it. And all of that contribution, I think, is really bound up in the stories, the impacts, and the narratives of graduates like Dr. Tucker. And I'll just spend maybe 60 seconds talking about that, coming to a fairly personal point, actually. Uh, so Dr. Tucker, as you will no, no doubt here, grew up in a small fishing village up in the Northern Peninsula came to Grenfell campus, did a psychology degree, went on to do a PhD in neuroscience through the Faculty of Medicine in St. John's, went on to further studies at Harvard University, and is now an internationally recognized expert in the field of ophthalmology and particularly retinal specialty, and works as a not just a professor, but an endowed chair um, at uh, the University of Iowa and is making great breakthroughs in, in the field of particularly retinal studies and genetic, genetic work in there. And this is the personal part. I have terrible falling apart retinas. So thank you. <laughs> the work that you're doing, which really began, you know, he, I'm sure it began in the Northern Peninsula with your family, but in terms of academic growth and development began here. And you were making an impact on the lives of, of people all over the world, perhaps even my own eyes at some point. Um, and that is the story of the psychology program. So all the students that are working today towards your degrees, these are the kinds of contributions, no pressure, that, uh, that you have ahead of you into the future. So I'll end my remarks there and just say to the psychology program, those founding individuals as well as current um, vibrant individuals, we are inspired by all that you have done, are doing, and no doubt will continue to be inspired by that moving into the future. We all join you in congratulating you on the success that you're celebrating today. Thank you for all that, and we can't wait to see what you do into the future. And if you could save my retinas, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Sutherland. Uh, next, I invite Dr. Montes Chima, Associate Vice President, Grenfell Campus, Research and Graduate Studies, to bring greetings from his office. Thanks so much. And I don't have notes, actually. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Tucker back home. Uh, actually, I received email Dr. Sonia back in July, I believe. 
and I saw two common things. At that time, I know this program was started in 1993, and I started my career in university back in 1993 as well. So I was thinking I have also completed 30 years in research and teaching. Uh, secondly, I did my postdoc in Iowa State University of Science and Technology, not in Iowa, but a university. Iowa State is basically the land grant university that works a lot in the agriculture sectors, where I am actually coming from. Um, actually, I was talking with Dr. Tuck a short while ago about the program. So I just want to share the accomplishments of the research and grad studies Grenfell. We have eight programs. Uh, I think the first program started in 2012. So now in 2021, I think the total number was 92. Last year it was 126. So this year, the total number of grad students are 167. And the total grants for this year is around 6 million. And the number, the matrix, such matrix is going up actually. So that's the good thing which I want to share with the whole community. So I would like to congratulate all psychology program uh, alumni, uh, all students, faculty members, and particularly the founding faculty members who initiate this program. So I really congratulate everybody for this success story and achieving the 30 years of the university as well. Thank you so much. Wait your turn, Pranika. Thank you, Dr. Chima. It is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Veronica Hutchings, Grenfell Psychology alumnus, who will introduce today's keynote speaker. Thank you for waiting, Dr. Hutchings. <laughs> You're welcome, Dr. Pritchard. Um, so I guess I don't need to introduce myself now, uh, but anyway, I am the registered psychologist working in counseling and psychological services here. So while I'm cross-appointed to the psychology program, I don't teach, I provide the clinical services. Um, the psychology program was extremely excited uh, when Dr. Bud Tucker accepted our invitation to return to Grenfell as our keynote speaker for our 30th anniversary celebrations. And I was equally thrilled when they asked me to introduce him um, because Dr. Tucker, along with uh, a fellow faculty member, Dr. Kelly Warren, the three of us actually went through the program together um, back in the late 90s. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Bud A. Tucker was born and raised in a small fishing town on the coast of Newfoundland's Great Northern Peninsula, Reese Harbor, for those of you who know exactly where that is. He spent his formative years on his father's commercial, commercial fishing boats, where during the day they fished the waters of the North Atlantic for cod, shrimp, ocean perch, and Greenland halibut. In the fall of 96, he attended what was then Sir Wilfrid Grenfell College. In the winter of 1998, Dr. Tucker, along with Dr. Warren and myself, all wound up in psychology 29-25 with Dr. Leslie J.K. Um, and so began uh, our careers, I think, in psychology. Uh, interestingly enough, Dr. Tucker and I were also, I can't remember if you were in the class as well, uh, psychology 22-25 with Dr. Roy Hostetter learning. Um, Dr. Tucker and I were actually lab uh, learning partners and had a rat, Lisa Tamara, who I'm very proud to say learned the most different reinforcement schedules out of everybody in our class. Uh, I still have very fond memories of Lisa Tamara, who, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but it's been like over 20 years, but she was part of a great rat escape. She ended up living the remaining two years of her life in my bedroom um, on my desk, much to my parents' um, enjoyment. Thank you, Mom. Anyways. Um, so he, um, but during his time here, he actually completed his honors supervision under the supervision uh, of Dr. Dan Stewart, who is the father of another faculty member that we have here, an alumnus who spoke this morning, Dr. Pete Stewart. And that's where his interest in visual perception was piqued. Bud became the first person in his nuclear family to obtain a university degree in 2001. At the age of 23, he left commercial fishing behind and attended graduate school full time. In 2006, he obtained his PhD in neuroscience under the mentorship of Dr. Dr. Karen Miro at Memorial University, University at Memorial University of Newfoundland's School of Medicine, and moved to Boston to complete his postdoctoral training at the Scapens Eye Research Institute, Harvard Medical School, 
where in 2009, he was promoted to the rank of faculty. In 2010, he joined the Institute for Vision Research and Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science at the University of Iowa, where he holds the Ruby Endowed Chair of Regenerative Ophthalmology. He directs both the Ruby Retinal Engineering Laboratory, which is focused on the development of novel tissue engineering and robotic strategies for the production of autologous photoreceptor cell grafts and the DZ Translational Vision Research Facility, a CGMP manufacturing suite with ISO class five capabilities dedicated to the production of gene and cell-based therapeutics. The major focus of his laboratory is to combine state-of-the-art patient-specific induced pluripotent stem cell CRISPR-based genome editing and tissue engineering technologies to develop affordable gene and autologous photoreceptor cell replacement strategies for the treatment of patients with an inherited retinal degenerative blindness. In April of this year, he received the prestigious Kogan Award at the annual meeting of the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, or ARVO. ARVO is the largest eye and vision research organization in the world. Their members include nearly 10,000 researchers from over 75 countries. The Kogan Award recognizes a researcher 45 years of age or younger who has made important and worthwhile contributions to research in ophthalmology or visual science that are directly related to disorders of the human eye or visual system and who shows substantial promise for future contributions. Congratulations from us, Dr. Tucker. Fun fact, in 2018, the advisory board of the Institute for Vision Research announced the creation of an annual Heart of Our Vision Award to recognize someone in their organization who has made an exemplary contribution to the cure of heritable blindness. Dr. Tucker was chosen as the first recipient of this award and was presented with a Fender Telecaster guitar autographed by Bruce Springsteen to commemorate this event. Now that's a really cool trophy. So without further ado, I welcome my friend, Dr. Bud Tucker, Grenfell Psychology Program alumni, to the podium. So I... I uh... I truly don't deserve all of these these super kind words, but I, I will take them. Okay, let me get start on this thing here. So the thing Veronica did not say is we were actually best friends. She was my best friend all through uh, the undergraduate program. And like many of my friends, if it wasn't for Veronica, I would not have made it through the program. So I was a first generation student and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I, I was born and raised, as, as has been said, in a very small town on the northern uh, most reach of the, of the island, Reefs Harbor, super, super small, 80 plus people. Uh, my mother grew up on the other side of the northern peninsula in, in Main Brook, and her mom was born in St. Anthony. So my nuclear family really sort of surrounds the very tip of the island. And so in Reefs Harbor, like many of the small towns, we were all fishermen. So I grew up a fisherman on my, my father's boats and, and fished from the time I was about eight to 10 years old until I was early 20s. And uh, I learned a lot. So in my later years, I fished uh, off the northeast coast of Labrador uh, for Greenland halibut or turbot. And, and the most valuable thing I learned from this was that I was not going to be a fisherman. This is a horrible job. Okay, so it's, not, it's dangerous. It's not fun. Uh, it, it really sucked. So that was when I was like, okay, I'm going to college. I'm going somewhere. It's not going to be a fisherman. And so I decided that I was going to uh, start here at Sir Wilfer Grenfell College. And interestingly, uh, I had very little understanding of what that even meant at the time. Okay, so I enrolled in sort of the general first year, which is, you know, was the lingo I was told at the time. I had no idea what that meant, but uh, it was sort of a general courses. So I did mathematics, biology, um, chemistry, and psychology. Never even heard of psychology. And the funny thing is, then when I would go back home, for Christmas, I would tell people I, I just did psychology. The first question it asked me, you know what it was? What am I thinking? Yeah, the damn the same. Like psychology and being a psychic are two very different things. But you know, it, that sort of stuck for a long, long time. 
Uh, but it was in my first year, first semester at Grenfell, that the gentleman on the top left who's here this morning, Dr. Uh, Duffy, Jim Duffy, taught me introductory psychology. And it was his lecturing style and the course material that within, you know, single digit weeks of starting in the program, I decided I was going to be a psychology major. I had no idea what that meant at the time, uh, but what I knew I wanted to do was study something with human brain and biology. I was really interested in, in the sort of psychophysical connection between the brain and behavior. And so over the, the years, obviously I did a lot of different courses in psychology, and I in and, and this thing I put up one word. This was sort of a free association slide. When I was thinking about the professor and the impact they had on my sort of career, which courses immediately came to mind? So Dr. Roy Hostetter was history. Okay, I love Dr. Hostetter, but boy, was this guy boring. He could, he, I mean, he was, he, he would make himself fall asleep when he was lecturing. But he, he was, for some reason, he was also the director or the, the admin person for the arts program, the visual arts program. And so God love him, he, he waived the requirements for that arts program and allowed me to do printmaking. I did intaglio and lithography right here at this institution without a portfolio as a psychology student. So I, I, uh, I love Dr. Hosseter for that. And Dr. Cake was my cognitive psychology instructor and taught me two different cognitive psychology courses. Uh, and if I was to choose a mentor for my, my uh, honors thesis, it would, have been, it would have been Dr. Cake if it wasn't the person I chose. Then Dr. Daniels, Tom Daniels, he is the sole reason why I'm not a clinical psychologist. Okay. I did clinical psych and psychotherapy for, with Don da or Tom Daniels and immediately decided that would have been just as bad as fishing. So I, I did not do that. And then I had Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson was an incredible individual. So he taught me abnormal psychology. And, and what I'll call this is method acting, okay? He, at the very first lecture, is, this was the most amazing thing I'd ever witnessed. And I remember it you know, as, as we, in, in cognitive psychology, we get flashbulb memories. This is a flashbulb memory. Do, Dr. Ferguson came down, walked into the classroom. He was a very you know, large, intimidating presence. And he had this little stuffed pink pig, and he put it on the, on the table in the front of the classroom. And he started to pace back and forth in front of the class, and he was lecturing. And every now and again, mid-lecture, he would turn and he would talk to this pig. And he was acting out this fetish, this sexual fetish that he had for this, this pig as method acting to teach it. And I left the lecture, and I, I couldn't tell if it was brilliant or if he was actually insane. Right? And so then I ran down to talk to Tom Daniels, and I figured he was actually brilliant, so I, I, didn't, I didn't leave the program. But... They're all extraordinarily supportive. As you can see here, Duncan was always the bottom of the pyramid. You know, he would, he would mix with the students. Dr. Cake would mix with the students. And it was just this open door policy that's just not normal at most institutions. And it's definitely not normal at the institutions that I've been to beyond here. And, and you don't recognize how big of an impact that has until you're gone. You know, the grass is always greener. But I can tell you at Harvard, it's very, very different. Okay? At all of these institutions, is very different. And the impact that you're having on the young lives and training of these young individuals is just extraordinary. And I, I do truly owe all of my success to the psychology program here. And I say that uh, with great honesty. So another professor I want to talk to is actually uh, sitting in the crowd who was one of my uh, sort of closest friends in the psychology program and in the university was, uh, was Paul. So this, this gentleman taught me many a things, okay? The first thing he taught me was, uh, well, a, a, I should say, he was my first ever real boss, okay? So I was a fisherman up until now. I always, always worked for my father. So then Dr. Wilson uh, was a very active researcher in the program. And he did a lot of research that was based on surveys. So patient satisfaction surveys, uh, nurse and, and, and staff satisfaction surveys. So I learned how to generate, execute surveys, which were extraordinarily important. Uh, another thing I learned from him, if you've ever spoken with Dr. Uh, uh, Paul, is he was from the UK and had a love of scotch, and he had a scotch club. And I was one of the few students who managed to wriggle my way in and get invited once in a while. And to this day, I don't do surveys. <laughs> this is a picture from 2018 with my family 
in uh, in a small town off the southeast coast of southwest coast of Scotland called uh, Islay. And this is where all my favorite scotches are stilled, but uh, this is a very famous distillery called Ardbeg. And, uh, and I went here and the first person I thought of was Dr. Paul Wilson. So then we have Kelly. So Dr. Wilson was actually the head of counseling in the program. Kelly was the program psychotherapist. Okay, so we spent more time in Kelly's office than we did in the classroom. Uh, I think I probably spent more time in Kelly's office than I did at home. And so I don't know how Kelly ever got any work done. I, again, I didn't realize that because when you're a when you're a kid, you know, when you're young, it's so stressful. You're so anxious. And when you have someone like Kelly who will just take you into your office and just calm you down and tell you it's going to be okay, I just don't understand how she didn't always have a line of 30 people at her door. But she was such a, an honest sort of caring soul that, again, these people just made it possible for me to move on. And then I'm going to, going to end with faculty. So as you can see, I was here during the founders, right? So this is, I started in 1996. So this was the last of the founders, Dr. Uh, Daniels. So Dr. Or sorry, Dr. Stewart. I, I get screwed up on Daniels and Stewart. Uh, Dr. Stewart was, was a lot of things. So A, he was probably the smartest individual I'd ever met. There was nothing, I mean, he seemed to know everything about everything. And you know, you have those people where it's like, now we just go Google it, right? He was a walking Google. So whatever you ask him, he sort of knew. The other thing was he was an incredible judge of character. So not only did he know the material, he knew bet me better than I knew me. Right, so I did all of these courses with him. He graciously took me as his uh, honor student uh, in biopsych. So he taught me sensation perception and biopsych. And during those courses, you know, which were by far my best grades, if Duncan was was grading those, I'd have got the purple turkey. Tom, you know, <laughs> Stuart uh, didn't have a purple turkey, but they were definitely my my. That's what I gravitated towards: neuroscience, biopsych, these sorts of things. And so I, I was in one of these meetings, advisory meetings with him, and, I, and we were discussing what I was going to do in the future. And I told him I was going to go to medical school, because again, when you're from the North Pole, you're either going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. I didn't know any other path. And so I said, I'm going to medical school. And he's like, medical school? Why the hell would you do something like that? And I, literally, he said that. So I was like, well, you know, I was a little jarred. I'm like, well, what else would you do? He's like, have you ever thought about getting your PhD in medicine? specifically neuroscience. You know, you have such a passion for vision and sensation. Like, I think you'd be great at research. And, and with that recommendation, I actually, I did apply to medical school, didn't go to medical school, got in, didn't go, because I started my PhD with this woman in St. John's. So this is Karen Miro. She's a brilliant neuroscientist. She was the director of the neuroscience program. And with Karen, I published several papers, my very first publication. So this was sort of a luck of the draw situation. My very first publication was a good paper published in the European Journal of Neuroscience. I got the cover of the journal. So it's a pretty exciting thing when you're a grad student and all of a sudden the figure from your paper is, is you know, front and center on the journal. But all of that work at the time was really focused on sensory neuron regeneration. I didn't know anyone with a spinal cord injury or anything of that nature. I was just interested in neuroscience and regenerative medicine. So I show this picture. This is my wife. My wife actually graduated from this very program. So we were, we were high school sweethearts, started, started dating when I was 16. And so she did a psychology degree as well. And her, her PhD, or sorry, honors thesis supervisor was Dr. Cake. And so throughout, you know, when you're young, you don't pay a lot of attention to a lot of things. But Jill, from the time I knew her, when she was like eight years old, had an eye condition. And it was an inflammatory condition where she was having to take eye drops daily. Well, these eye drops, I didn't know at the time, were steroids because she has an ocular inflammation disease, it's genetic, uh, called uveitis or has a genetic component. And so years of steroid treatment caused cataracts. She had her cataracts removed when she was about 20 years old. Uh, but the problem with continued steroid use in the eye to keep the pressure down is eventually, or sorry, keep the inflammation down, eventually the pressure goes up and you develop diseases like glaucoma. And so unfortunately, she's lost a significant amount of visual field due to loss of retinal neurons. So I reasoned, why would I be working in the spinal cord doing nerve regeneration in the spinal cord if my wife has a, you know, a neurodegenerative eye condition? And so that's when, when I started to look for postdoctoral positions. And I jumped ship from, you know, basic neuroscience in the spine 
into ophthalmology at large. Really, still very neuropsychology, but I, I was looking for an ophthalmology lab. So I, I interviewed at about 30 different places all over the US and Canada. And I ended up joining the lab first of Michael Young. So Michael J. Young here in the top left. Mike uh, is an extraordinary individual who was the first to publish the use of the retinal stem cell. Okay, so he showed you could isolate a stem cell during a development of an organism, transplant that into a blind organism and restore vision. So that was what Mike published that in about 2003. And so I'd seen all that literature and that's why I went and interviewed with Mike. Then my co-mentor is this guy under here is George Daly. So I'm gonna say very little about George now, he'll come up in a minute. And the reason is I wanna tell you what a stem cell is before I go any further, because I know as a group of psychologists and psychology trainees, you're not a bunch of stem cell biologists. So this cartoon sort of says it all. What is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell that can become any other cell in the body, okay? It can't become Optimus Prime, but it can become you know, liver, kidney, whatever you want. So the true definition of a stem cell is a cell that is pluripotent, meaning it can become a cell of any of the three embryonic germ layers. The ectoderm is where our entire nervous system comes from. And it has an unlimited capacity for self-renewal, so it can make more of itself indefinitely. Okay, so with that definition, there was really only one true stem cell, and that was the embryonic stem cell, which I'm sure people have heard about because there was so much controversy surrounding the embryonic stem cell field. So the way it works is that the embryonic stem cell would get fate restricted and become all of these different cells in the body as it's differentiating. So what Mike first published is that you could take B here, which was a really a retinal progenitor, so it's fate restricted. It can't become all of the cells in the body, it can become all of the cells in the retina. And that's the cell he was focused on and showed you could make it. The problem, if you think embryonic stem cells are controversial, getting these guys, these come from a 20 week old fetus, right? So it's just not a feasible therapy. So everyone, including me, was focused on the use of embryonic stem cells. Fast forward, now in 2006, there was a seminal publication from a group from Japan, just two authors, which is very rare in this space. Uh, Yamanaka, Shinya Yamanaka, and a postdoc in his lab, Takahashi, showed that they could take just four genes and force expression of those four genes in skin, so just dermal fibroblasts, and turn those skin cells into an embryonic stem cell state. So now, this was so important that four years later, Takahashi and Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize. This was the fastest ever discovery to Nobel Prize in medicine. And the reason it's so powerful is because now I can generate stem cells from anyone in this room. And if you have a genetic disease, those cells, once I turn them into the tissue that's being affected, are going to have the disease in the dish, right? So now I can model pathology. I can use those samples to test novel therapeutics, drugs and gene-based therapies. And what's the other great advantage? They're yours. So if I wanna make a cell type to go back into you, it's autologous, so it's matched to you immunologically. So the risk of rejection is greatly reduced. So this is why Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize. So interestingly, like everything in science, this wasn't a, a, a one-person show. So George Daly at Harvard had been working on the same thing, and four months after this paper came out, George had showed it in human cells. This was done in mouse. So George was about three months short of winning the Nobel Prize. That's how science works. George did okay, he's the dean of Harvard Medical School. But once this came out, another one of these sort of fortuitous things, he gave this talk at our institute and I immediately went up and said, dude, you gotta take me in your lab. This is what's gonna cure blindness. And he did, he graciously did. So that's where I got all of my IPS cell training. So now I'm all trained up. The problem with Harvard, and I was faculty there, I was doing quite well, I was very well funded, I could have stayed. You can't live in Boston. Boston's a very expensive city, and if you're from the North Pole with 85 people, you stick you in a two million person city, you know, it, it was really a challenge for the five years I was there, and, and you know, one night before I went to this national meeting, Arvo, which is our big annual meeting, my wife sort of had a, you know, semi-breakdown, which is like, okay, we're either gonna have two kids or one child and a mortgage. We can't afford both and live in Boston. So the decision was I was gonna leave Harvard because this was just not livable. So I went and I interviewed at every place that you know, was available. And the University of Iowa, which has had this you know, incredible history in ophthalmology, they've, they've traditionally ranked in the top uh, 10 with nationally in the ophthalmology program, uh, 
had this guy, Ed Stone, and Ed Stone will come up at the very end, but Ed was, was uh, an HHMI investigator, which is sort of the CRC equivalent in Canada, and an incredible doctor. So what Ed did, which none of these other places that were recruiting me did, was we went off, you know, you like you do at these meetings, you go off and find some secluded little place to talk business. And it was very different. He, he sat down with me, pulled out of his briefcase a yellow legal pad and a pen and put them in front of me. He said, write down everything you need to cure blindness and I'll get it for you. And 12 weeks later, I was living in Iowa City. I had bought and moved into my house before I signed my job offer. So it was a risky decision, but this guy came through on everything. He's absolutely incredible. So now I'm living in Iowa. So jump forward to what my lab does. So we really focus on treating retinal degenerative blindness. Okay, these are diseases ranging from glaucoma, so it's neurodegeneration. Glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, all the way down to the rarest of the rare forms of retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, none of this needs to mean anything to anyone in this room, but what I'm going to do right now is describe, just so we're all on sort of the same level, what the tissue even looks like. Okay, so for those of us who are not neuroanatomists, uh, the retina, just like the cerebral cortex of the brain, is a laminated structure. So it's a bunch of neurons piled one on top of the other. Interestingly, the retina is sort of upside down. As light enters your eye, it has to pass through all of these different layers of neurons before it's detected by the outer segment, a portion of this cell called a photoreceptor in the very mo outermost layer of the retina. There, that light is turned into an electrochemical impulse and sent to the brain via the optic nerve. Right, so if you destroy these cells up here, these are retinal ganglia cells, this causes glaucoma. If you destroy these cells, you get age-related macular degeneration and any of the different genetic diseases that are called RP. So on the right, what am I showing you here? This is a normal fundus photo. Again, you don't need to know anything about this clinical imaging other than I'm going to show you how it changes over time. So this is a normal fundus photo. You see this sort of orange-pink sheen, and you see these large caliber blood vessels which run over the surface of the retina. These are called the arcades. This is actually my retina. One of the great things being in a clinical department is you can do whatever you want on yourself. Okay. So then under that, we have an OCT. So again, this is my OCT. So this is a normal OCT. And what an OCT does is allows us to look at the layers of your retina in real time, in a living human. So the dark layers are the cell bodies. The bright layers are where the axons and, and synapses are. So it's where the, all of the neurons connect. So you can follow, these are all the photoreceptors here. This last thing is a Goldman visual field. The only thing you need to know about that is the width of that big old lump is how wide our visual field is. The height is how sensitive it is. So right in the middle, as we all know, we have much higher acuity vision in here than we do out here. So in patients who have these disorders, what happens? So they have a genetic defect that over time, you get loss of these photoreceptor cells. And the inner retina eventually collapses down on the bottom layer, which is called the retinal pigmented epithelium, and then they're completely blind. And this, like any neurodegenerative disorder, our central nervous system doesn't regenerate. Our peripheral nervous system does quite well. Central nervous system, once they're gone, you're done. What you see now is complete constriction. The visual field's almost completely gone. The arcades all get really tiny because all those cells that were consuming oxygen are gone, so it all auto-regulates. And the OCT, you see there's no photoreceptors left. So what causes these diseases? Well, this is a study that me and Ed Stone did back in 2016, which was a survey of 1,000 consecutive families seen in our clinic. And so these families, there were actually 3,348 individuals over five years, came from 40 states, D.C., and seven countries. So we had about 350, 400 patients in here from Canada. So it's a pretty wide swath. Interestingly, there was 104 different genes we found to cause these diseases. So neither one of these is really a single disease, right? So we have a clinical entity, which is retinitis pigmentosa. There's 80 genes causes retinitis pigmentosa. The top, you know, very, very small, 10 genes cause 60% of disease. So what's the problem? The problem is the vast majority of genes cause disease in handfuls of patients. And in the U.S., with the U.S. structure, meaning medical structure, which is an insurance-based thing, you don't have insurance, you're not getting treated anyway. But all of, indus, or all of medicine is really driven by big pharma. Big pharma is not going to touch anything that's affecting 100 people in the whole country. There's no money to be made in it. So we had kept hitting our heads against this thing where we thought what we had to do was diagnose, show how the disease work, and big pharma would make the treatment for it, and we would just go order it for our patients. It's not the case. They're never touching it. 
So then what we started to ask ourselves is, well, how do we treat the disease? Well, it really depends on two things, how much you know about the disease. If you don't know what the gene is, right, you don't know how the disease works, you're not going to go in early and prevent the disease. If you do know those things, drug or gene therapy, it's always going to be best to prevent progression. That's our goal. Unfortunately for a lot of patients, at the time they present, they've lost all or most of their photoreceptor cells. So gene or drug therapy is going to be useless. What we need for those is a more aggressive restorative approach, so that's cell replacement. So I'm going to present the rest of my talk as a case study. So these two young girls are six years old, and these are two of our patients. They're twins. This is her sixth birthday, and this is what their retinas look like. Again, you don't need to know anything about a fundus photo other than the fact that this is not normal. See how different the sheen is than mine? How constricted the blood vessels are. And this number at the bottom is their visual acuity. I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of visual acuity. Normal is 2020, meaning what you could see at 20 feet, I can see at 20 feet. These girls, what I can see at 320 feet, they can see at 20 feet. Okay, so it's not normal vision. It's actually quite poor vision. However, they have pretty full visual fields, so they're not blind by any stretch of the imagination. So if we could prevent this from being lost, that would be a huge win in these girls. So what do they have? Well, unfortunately, uh, if I was to tell you that they were completely normal a year before this birthday, there's only one disease that does this. And the gene is called CLN3, and the disease is called Batten disease. So these children go from completely normal vision at about age five to about 2300, 2400 by age six. Uh, it's a lysosomal storage disorder, which is pretty aggressive. By age 12, there'll be light perception at best, or no light perception. So you have a child that's perfectly normal vision at age five, six years later, they will be completely blind. That's not the worst part of the disease. As they're 15 to 18 years old, they start to have seizures. By the time they're 25 years old, they have significant cognitive decline. By the time they're 30, they die. So you had a perfectly normal child with a gene defect we know. This disease is so rare, no one's ever going to work on it. That's the problem we have in the U.S. with our corporate model of, of medicine. So what we decided is what we need to do for families, this family and families like it, was we needed to build our own treatment. And so what do these two girls need? They need gene therapy. We need to prevent nerve degeneration in these two girls. So how does that work? So gene therapy is a very hackneyed term uh, because it means a lot of things. But for the simplest sort of form, all I'm describing when I say gene therapy is restoring a gene's function. So these two girls have a mutation in this disease gene, CLN3. Most common mutation, which both of them have, is a large deletion of 1,000 base pairs. So essentially, it just knocks out the gene completely. There's no CLN3 protein. So our task then is to make a new gene, put it back in the cells that are missing it, because if they have that gene, then the cells won't die. Pretty simple, right? How do we do that? We do it using viral approaches. So the one great thing with viruses, as much as COVID has sucked for the first few years of, of you know, battling with it, uh, viruses are really good at infecting cells and dumping DNA cargo in them. Right? This is what they do for a living. So we've taken these viruses, known as adeno-associated viruses, gutted them so they have none of their own genome in it, they can't replicate, and we put the genes in we want. They're still really good at infecting, but when they infect the cell now, they dump in the gene that they need, not the, not the viral gene. So this is what gene therapy is. I'm going to go very quickly through the data because it's not really important, and I only want you to look at a few bands anyway. But this is patient from the twins. You can see without the gene therapy, there's no protein product. With the gene therapy, we can completely restore that normal protein. The other thing that's really cool, this thing up here on the left, you know what that is? That's a little brain I made in the dish from that little girl's forearm. And that little brain will degenerate in the dish if not treated. And so we can make that virus, we can infect, you can see no protein in both of the twins. You can restore it just by putting in 10 microliters of virus that is that's carrying this gene. The other cool thing, which I, I alluded to, in these mini brains, you can see the disease phenotype, right? So when you're going to the FDA, the first thing the FDA wants to see is, was it effective? Okay, so did it work? Well, in most cases, there's an animal model. There's no animal model for this. This is very rare. There is now, with this induced pluripotent stem cell, the ability to have a model we can actually test the effect of the treatment. So you can see they accumulate. So this is the normal here is the two patients, they accumulate all of this gnarly lysosomal storage material. Again, for anyone who's not familiar, the lysosome is really the garbage man of the cell. If you knock out the garbage cleaner, it starts to look like Paris, France when all the, the guys are on strike, 
right? There's just bags of garbage everywhere. The cell is the same thing. So if you accumulate all of that material, it's toxic. So our goal then was to go in, infect these cells before the, the garbage strike, and when you do that, you can completely prevent disease. So our next step now is to treat these girls. Well, how do you do that? Again, the problem is the FDA is not going to say, well, you made this thing in your lab. You could just go treat them, right? There are all of these standards that are just really prohibitive to access to the clinic. And so what we decided when we, we finally got sick of waiting for Big Pharma to produce these things is we were going to do it ourselves. So we went out and we raised a lot of money through philanthropy. And we built our own manufacturing facilities. So I own and control all of these facilities at the University of Iowa. This is just a simple clean room, which ISO class five is just, they have all these silly jargon and stuff. But really what it means is that in this space we're currently standing in and breathing air, there's about 10 million particles of a half a micron in diameter that we suck into our lungs for every cubic meter of air that we breathe. In this room, it goes from 10 million down to 1,000. Within these hoods, it goes from 1,000, which is in the room, down to 10. Okay, so if you need to produce a therapy that's going into a patient, you have to do it in one of these facilities. So we built our own facilities, we built our own treatments, what's the next step? Well, this is one of my surgical colleagues, Steve Russell. The next step is to go put this in the retina. Where do you put it? You put it beneath the retina. So you have a little needle, and you stick the needle through the retina into the subretinal space, and you just squirt it in there. It's a little blister. Okay, and it makes this little bubble of virus, which then spreads and infects all of those photoreceptor cells. And when you do that, you can completely prevent these people from going blind. What about these people? This is the second case study. So this family, as you can tell by looking at this photo, is a little further along in the disease process. So they have the same disease. This girl is sitting in a wheelchair, okay, which is unfortunate because she's only 11 years old. And she's at age 11, she has no light perception. Her brother, which you could see there, has Lego vision, okay? So this is, you know, when you have little kids, it's hard to get these, these visual acuities. So we make up all kinds of silly things. So he can still play with Lego and put Lego together. So at age five, he has good enough vision to put Lego together. His sister is no, no light perception. So that's how aggressive this disease is. So he needs gene therapy, like I just showed you, to prevent him from going blind. She doesn't. She needs a cell replacement approach. And so, that's really where the largest focus of my lab is. This is a much more complex approach. This is actually work. I'm not going to get into all the details. I just put it up as sort of a placeholder. This is work I did as a postdoc in, in Mike and George's lab. And the cool thing here, you know, these cells are all red. We had a mouse that every cell in its body fluoresced red if you hit it with a blue light. Wild mice to have it running around one of the bars here. You know, they're all just, everything is totally red. It's super cool. But if you make stem cells from these guys, the stem cells glow red. And then you can track them after you transplant them. So we did this, this experiment was the first that was published where we showed we could take these induced pluripotent stem cells and generate retina photoreceptors. We transplanted those back into mice that had no photoreceptors. And you can see we can make a whole bunch of new photoreceptors. They make connections with the neurons that are in the inner retina. And they restore vision. So if you shine a light in their eye and do a flash and record from the animal, the untreated eye is flat, the treated eye, you can restore electrical activity. The more cells you put in, the bigger is the visual recovery. Okay, so this was the proof of concept that this would work. Fast forward now about eight to 10 years and the technology is evolving. So now we can take human, this is human stem cells, human pluripotent stem cells that I generate from all of our patients. This is actually a huge colony. There's about 10,000 cells in this colony, so it's a lower magnification. And you can generate these 3D retinal organoids in a dish. So these are mini retinas, human retinas, floating around. Cool thing is, they look just like a human retina. They laminate in the dish just like the human retina does during development. It's remarkable. So you see at 150 days, you get all the inner neurons, all the outer neurons, these are all photoreceptors. You go another 100 days, not only does the photoreceptor cell layer get distinct with the plexiform layer in here where all the synapses are, but the cones, there are two populations of photoreceptors, rods and cones. The cones go to the outermost limits just where they are in the human normally. It's absolutely remarkable that this does it. So it's, there's a genetic program that you just got to push in place and it does it on its own. All you got to be do is good at, at selecting it. Now, if I go take these photoreceptors and transplant them in a mouse, I can restore vision in the mouse, right? Human photoreceptors. What's the problem? Well, I just told you if I make these cells, they make disease in the dish. 
Okay, so if I go transplant them without correcting that genetic mutation, they're just going to die again, right? So we were almost there, and in 2015 came along, and this new technology was was published. And it, this is another one of those, uh, you know, like the George Daly things, very close. Uh, we published the first paper in this with a group out of Boston, Shinya Yamanaka, and it's called CRISPR-based genome editing. And for anyone who's interested in what CRISPR means, it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Say that 10 times fast. But what the CRISPR is, CRISPR acronym, and that technology is the immune system of a bacteria. So bacteria, we don't usually think about bacteria of having immune systems, but they do. So there are viruses that infect bacteria called bacteriophage. Right? So they're, they're being infected with viruses like we are. And so they've engineered their own immune system to be able to recognize the genetic sequence of that virus and chop it up the next time it comes in. It's genius. And so what a group of, of scientists in Harvard and at Berkeley uh, discovered is that they could co-opt this to make targeted double-stranded breaks in DNA. If you break DNA in a human cell, we have machinery to go repair that break. So what we've done as I'm showing you here, you can take these small guides, target them wherever you want in the genome, right? So if I had a mutation here, I make the guide put it close to my mutation. That guide has a little scaffold that recruits this, this nuclease. So a nuclease is just an enzyme that makes a double-stranded break in DNA. We create that double-stranded break. If we co-deliver a piece of normal DNA, it repairs off the normal DNA, completely corrects the genetic mutation. It's just genius. So this one took a little longer for the Nobel Prize, but Jennifer Dodna, who published the first paper in this, won the Nobel Prize seven years after this first publication was made. So these, these are really landmark discoveries in the space of, of uh, gene editing and stem cell biology. So the cool thing is we've gone on and published, you know, 20 papers in this space and, and is no longer focused on single point mutations. We've, with these, this child I just showed you, uh, this again is a huge chunk of the gene is missing. We can just go in and make a double-stranded break, replace the whole gene, and, and we're hunky-dory. So this person here, you know, they were they have no gene at all. They had this small product because a thousand base pairs is missing. We can go in their stem cells and make a line that's identical to them, with the exception that their CLN3 gene is now normal. It's quite remarkable. So we're almost there, right? So now I can inject these normal cells in there. The problem is, and one of the reasons why I went to train with Mike back in the day. If you do this same injection experiment that I was showing you, I could do all of this restoring vision, you do that in an animal that has no photoreceptors left, it doesn't work. And the reason is the cells have nowhere to go, right? If there's still outer nuclear layer there, meaning photoreceptors, they can integrate in that structure and they're all happy. They have someone to hold on to. So what Mike showed was that if you do the same experiment and instead of just injecting the cells, you transplant them on a sheet of polymeric material, you could increase survival like tenfold. And so that was all very encouraging. The problem was all of the approaches we had for engineering these scaffolds were pretty crude. So we used things like electro spinning, salt leaching, templating, whatever it was, and we destroyed a lot of retinas trying to make biocompatible polymers. The thing we could never do was make a graft or a scaffold that would allow us to organize the retina like the retina is organized. You can see here it's very, very, very intentional and deliberately aligned. So then again, this is the last technology that we, we jumped on. This is called two-photon lithography. So this is a part of my, uh, my engineering laboratory. So this is really a fancy 3D printer is what it is. But it's based on a technology that uh, a lot of people in the field of optics have used for a long time, which is photopolymerization. So if you have a pool of free polymer and you hit it with light, it'll, it'll congeal essentially, right? So if you do that with light that is very, very focused, so where a single photon of light hits another single photon of light in the same place and time, you can get polymerization at that very location. So we can print things that are subcellular now. And so this was a huge risk because this technology existed, but it was for plastics. So we bought this piece of equipment, you know, pretty sure we could make it work. We convinced a donor we could make it work. <laughs> And he bought us his million dollar scope and we made it work, thankfully. But now we can, we can print any structure our heart desires. So if you can make it in CAD, I can fabricate it. So here's an example of PCL, which is one of our, our polymer materials. It's biodegradable, super biocompatible. You can fill it with photoreceptors that I'm showing you here. This is the top. You can see they make their little outer segments, push them down through. Now I have a sheet I can go transplant, which is what I want to do in a human. 
So here's one of our, our subjects. So we have a bunch of different animal models. This pig is actually a blind pig. And uh, Emily, who's my, my, one of my vet techs, uh, is fantastic. She's like the pig whisperer, so she takes care of all of our pigs. And, uh, and, you know, we had to build some interesting tooling and stuff to get it in, but we can transplant these graphs the exact same size of what we're going to put in a human in the pig and follow it over months. And we can, doing that, we can see that the material is, and the graph is compatible, so there's no untoward effects either locally or systemically. The FDA asks for systemic tox studies. So what that means in FDA jargon is go do a ton of animals that have no immune system and show me that those cells don't turn into tumors and go rogue outside of the eye, right? Because that's what the FDA is concerned about. We don't cause cancer in someone. So we did this massive study with miniaturized versions. It's completely safe. It sits in the subretinal space. We've done it now for up to eight months. There's no untoward effect. And the next step is production, the exact same thing. So this part of the facility was actually the first part we built. And it was built from the ground up for stem cell production. So it's very unique in that it has some very uh, specialized pieces of equipment. So these things are called biospheric units, which you'll see now. And they're really just glorified glove boxes. So you're isolated from the cell production area. But they are completely controlled atmospheric. So I, so I can control the gas tension, the particle counts, the humidity, everything. So it's really like I'm working inside the body. The one problem with that is I'm working inside the body. It's hot as hell, right? So if you're in there in a full jump suit, you get your arms in at 37 degrees Celsius, it, it's really challenging to work in there for long periods of time. The other problem with it is this whole process that I showed you takes about, you know, 35, 40 weeks to generate cells, take it all the way to retina. So it's not for the faint of hearts. The problem with that is that a single technician can't make more than a dozen of these a year, right, in one of these rooms that are very expensive. So we really need to change the way we're manufacturing. Clinical manufacturing is really designed for scale-up, large bats. They're intending to make gallons of drug to treat thousands of patients with the same condition. If we're now talking about treating every patient with their own drug, we need to change how we're manufacturing these things. So this is really where my lab has been focused over the last two, three years in developing robotics. This is one of the first robots we, we built. Uh, this is called the Cellex. It's really a, you know, a, a robot built over an automated microscope. And so the reason for doing that is because we could put a dish of cells on this thing, have the, have the system automatically image it, as, as you can see here, and we can track every cell for the life of the experiment. We can do that through stem cell generation. So you see we start here with fibroblasts, and as you go, you can see these IPS cell colonies start to form. The other cool thing is that we, we built in pumps for feeding. So all of these plates of cells to keep them alive, we have a, essentially a blood derivative, a fake blood which is media, and it has to be replaced every day or every two days. Which, again, if you're doing that for 260 days, you, know, you better have good technicians and good hands. You don't want to get an infection at day 200 and have to throw the whole thing away, right? So this robot can do that. The other cool thing this robot can do is you can see here we've built in a syringe pump that can actually go in and isolate single cells and move them from one dish and move it to the other, which is one of the most challenging things that, that a technician does. Uh, in stem cell generation, because as you can imagine, you have a whole sea of skin-derived cells, and you have these colonies of stem cells popping up. So traditionally, you would go in by hand with a needle and dissect those colonies and pick them out and put them in a plate to expand them as a line for the patient. This robot can do that. When we do that, they're completely normal. I'm going to skim over this data because it's not really uh, that interesting, other than to say that you know they have a normal karyotype, which is one of the tests. Uh, we can make normal retina, the same thing I just showed you. And the really cool thing, so how, how would you normally validate a protocol? What you would do is you would compare it to your standard, gold standard protocol. So we did one step further. So instead of making the cells on the robot and comparing it to ones we made by hand, we made the cells on the robot and compared it to ones that a lab 2,000 miles away made by hand. And the reason I could do that is this newer technology called single cell RNA sequencing. So now we can sequence the entire genome of single cells. So you could harvest those organoids, sequence every gene and every cell in there, and when we do that, we get the same cells, same proportion uh, as Tom Ray, is, who's a very famous scientist on the west coast of, of the U.S., gets. So our very last thing we're doing now is incorporating other components into the robotic platform. So we have another select device, as you can see here, but now we have a six-axis arm, because with the first one, you got to go in the incubator and pull the plate out, put it on the robot, right? No one wants to do that all day. 
So we're going to have a robotic arm do it for us. We also have a Lyconic incubator, which can hold 500 patients worth of cells. And if you just saw the flash there, we incorporated a barcode reader so that this arm can take a plate of a patient off of there, turn it around, scan it. All of the identity of the patient goes into our system, put it on the Selects device, image it, feed it, pick it, put it back in the incubator, and it can do this for up to 500 days if we wanted it to. And we have this master you know, schedule we built. So I can go in and say, Miss, Miss McGillicuddy on day one is going to get this media. On day 150 is going to get this media. And so that's, that's really where we're headed. Uh, this is all very new. Uh, we're still in the process of expanding on this technology. Uh, but none of this would be possible without a lot of people. And, and a lot of people who I mentioned at the first of the talk, I mean, it's sort of remarkable that a, a bumpkiss fisherman from the North Pole you know, even did a psychology degree, but then go from a psychology degree to end up at Harvard to end up in his own lab like this. So, you know, there's been a lot of happy accidents along the way. And the only thing I'll really take credit for is the ability to convince people that uh, they should take me under their wing. And, and, and uh, that's been very successful. But this guy here is, is the real genius. So Ed Stone has worked for 30 years in this space. He is the most famous ophthalmologist of all time. He has an H index for anyone who, who's familiar with the H index of about 106, which means he has at least 106 papers cited 106 times. He's actually published 600 papers to date, uh, the only ophthalmologist in the Howard Hughes, and he built the entire institution. So he is the guy who came to me at Arvo and said, write it down and I'll get it for you. And he has not failed on one of his promises. He's the most incredible selfless physician I have ever met. And the other gentleman next to him is one of my best friends in the Institute, Rob Mullins. He is the world's expert in age-related macular degeneration. And he's really figured out how that disease works. And I guarantee somebody in this room has a grandmother, grandfather with AMD. It's common as dirt over the age of 70. And then, of course, I should thank all the members of my lab. I have a pretty big group. Uh, all of the funding sources, these are the federal funding sources, you know, NIH grants, NSF grants and things. Uh, and then philanthropy. So 60% of this program is really run by private dollars, philanthropic dollars, because grants aren't funding, you know, me to build a $15 million GMP facility, right? They're just not. So that is, that is Grateful Patients does all of that. So you, we really have to give a lot of our thanks to our Grateful Patients. And with that, I will stop and say I am super, super honored to have been, to have been uh, you know, given this opportunity. It's just I, I told Veronica this earlier. I get a lot of requests to give talks, especially after you give a big award lecture and stuff like that. And so I ha I've had to set up rules. If not, my family suffers. I'm, the lab's not there. And so I, I have a thing where it's three conferences a year and four talks a year. That's it. And I didn't even, I didn't even consult my schedule when Sonia reached out and asked for this one because I said, absolutely, I'll be there tomorrow. Yeah, and I was so excited to come back. So anyway, thank you very much for the, the incredible, incredible uh, invitation. Thank you. My camera turned on. Someone's spying on me. <laughs> so on behalf of all of us, um, thank you. It's a little token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. You. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, really, Dr. Tucker, that was absolutely amazing. It's so neat, you know, to think, um, you know, over 20 years ago, we were upstairs in the dem room, um, you know, running back and forth to Kelly's office, trying to figure out how to do the stats lab. And now we're both back here um, in what used to be outside. Um, and it's just, it's really, really neat to hear all the amazing work you're doing. Thank and you. we're just so incredibly proud and so thrilled to have you back. So thank you very much. Thank you. Something like that. All right. Perfect. All right. Oh. Um, I also would like to thank Dr. Thuzzolin and Dr. Chima for their comments as well as their support uh, for uh, today's event. So we have a little thank you for the both of you as well. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for coming today. I would like to echo Dr. Pritchard's comments from earlier. Thank you to the scholarship in the arts. 
program, um, the Office of the Vice President, the Office of the Associate Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies uh, for all their financial support. I would like to thank Marcom for their support in promoting uh, today's event. Um, it's, it's really, especially coming for myself as a former graduate to be here, it's, it's been such uh, a fantastic day and I can feel myself kind of um, getting a little bit overwhelmed here. It's just, it's been really, really wonderful. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues in the psychology program um, for inviting me to be up here to introduce uh, Dr. Tucker. Um, and just having this event in particular, uh, I know it was mentioned this morning, but Dr. Sonia Corbin DeWire, if we could all give her a round of applause because she has been the one who has really taken this on and organized all of this stuff and has, you know, organize the food and the, the, the speeches and, and the, the trivia tonight, which is happening in the back lab. It's a free event, all ages. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, for psych majors, anyone can come. It's fantastic, 6.30 to 8, free. Um, please uh, turn up for that. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Corbin Dwyer and, and the rest of the psychology program. You've all contributed in, in various different ways. Uh, and of course, to our, our, our founders, um, the original six, I really appreciate that. Um, once again, we have refreshments there in the back. There's some cookies, some cupcakes, hot chocolate, tea, coffee. Um, stick around. Um, if you have questions, you know, we'll be here. Please do um, stay, uh, enjoy some refreshments, chat, and hopefully we'll see you all tonight uh, at the back lot. So thank you once again, everyone, and um, congratulations to everyone on uh, today's events. Thank you.